story at uh, my first time in Live Jump. Um, so everything I'm going to talk about is uh, so random rigidity in Everything I want to talk about is joint work with my students, Alden Walker. Um, so, since I have a bit of time to, to talk, uh, I thought I might... Um, so I want to talk about uh, uh, a couple of theorems in uh, geometric group theory, ergodic theory, geometry, loosely speaking. Um, and I want to kind of put it in a context in which it's sort of the theorems we can prove are, are part of a uh, are sort of approximation of a conjectural picture. So I want to kind of motivate this conjectural picture. Um, so most of what I'm talking about is joint with Alden Walker. What we're talking about today is also joint with with uh, Alden Walker, but if I get to talk about the hyperbolic groups part, or a more complicated part, that will be joint with um, Joseph Mark. And so I hope I'll say something about that, maybe maybe on the, the third one. Um, but for today, um, I want to sort of just sort of motivate what I'm going to talk about. Uh, so it starts with uh, a well-known sort of story in geometry that motivates a kind of conjectural picture in, in sort of group theory, and we can sort of verify that picture, at least in the important case, special case of three groups, and then uh, we can verify it sort of in a, an approximate extent in some broader class of groups, like all groups, packing class groups, and so on. And so um, I want to start out talking about rigidity. What do I mean by rigidity? So the classical um, theorem in rigidity is the, well, the so-called Moscow rigidity theorem says exactly the following. So let M1, M2 be closed hyperbolic manifolds of dimension at least three. This is not the most general thing one can say, but anyway, this is sort of uh, the starting point of the story. Close hyperbolic manifolds of dimension at least three, then any homotopy equivalence is homotopic to an isometry. Okay, so this is sort of, it's a very well-known theorem, but it's, it's, it's not always an amazing theorem in the start of uh, a vast subject. And, and so what does it really, I mean, what does it say? It's, it's, it's telling you that, that there's sort of, if you're working in some, some category, the homotopy category, then this hypothesis that there's somehow in the background of this closed hyperbolic um, these hyperbolic structures on your manifolds tells you that 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 sort of um, there's no there's no sort of extra extra kind of flexibility after we pass to this, this sort of a priori more flexible category this homotopy category we don't have any sort of a priori we don't even though we might expect that there might be more exotic kind of uh, maps around it turns out that there are, there are none there are only the ones that sort of came from from the the uh, uh, hyperbolic structures in other words. The geometric category and the, and the sort of topological category, just the homotopy category, are kind of essentially equivalent when restricted to these special objects. Okay, so what, what, let me just, by the way, to, to, be, to be clear that we're talking about the same things, closed manifolds is a, is a uh, you know, compact without boundary. Um, hyperbolic meaning that they are Riemannian manifolds uh, which have a metric which is uh, locally asymmetric to hyperbolic space here of dimension. Uh, N, uh, and, well, you know what homotopy equivalence is. So, um, from hyperbolic manifolds, it's, it's sort of uh, uh, well known that, that 
all the homotopy type of the manifolds is essentially carried by the fundamental group. Uh, all the higher homotopy groups are, are trivial. And so homotopy privileges are, are exactly the same thing as uh, um, conjugacy classes of isomorphisms of fundamental groups. So what this is saying is, although on the face of it, this is sort of a geometric uh, or topological theorem, and of course it has that, that aspect to it, you could think of it as a purely uh, group theoretic or sort of group theoretic, geometric group theoretic statement saying that a particular group, namely the fundamental group of a manifold, which happens to admit this structure of, of being a close hyperbolic manifold of dimension uh, at least three, you can recover the geometry uniquely if it exists just from the abstract group, the abstract fundamental group. So I'll just sort of say homotopy privilege here, this comes down. Okay, so in particular, geometric features of these manifolds can be recovered from purely uh, the algebraic object, this fundamental group. Well, it can be recovered, but that doesn't mean that it's easy to do so. So you could say that there's a fundamental problem that this raises. Which is the following. Given a, let's say, a manifold uh, M known to admit a hyperbolic structure or um, a group G known to be uh, isomorphic to so the fundamental group of some hyperbolic manifold. How do we see the geometry of the manifold directly in, in well, so the topology of M? or the algebra of D, right? I mean, this, it's there. The theorem tells you that if you can find the hyperbolic structure, it's sort of unique. And therefore, if you're, if you're, if you're assured that there is such a structure, somehow that, that's, that's you being told the whole story. How do you perceive this directly in the, in the object, you know, this a priori more flexible object, this topological manifold of this uh, algebraic group, how do you perceive the geometry directly uh, in, that, in that structure? And, and what I mean is that we have a geometric object. There are a lot of natural quantities or invariants you might want to associate to that. You have a manifold, a geometric manifold. There are, you, know, you can talk about the volume of the manifold. You can talk about the spectrum of the Laplacian. You can talk about the length of GD6. You can talk about the systoles. There's lots and lots of geometric uh, features of a manifold, that you geometric manifold, that are, are uh, very important. How do you perceive those objects directly in the in the you know, if you're just given a topological manifold or just given a group and you're told without even telling you maybe what the what the manifold is that this is the fundamental group of some hyperbolic manifold? How do you see this this uh, geometry? So there's a very famous, um, very famous uh, key example of. Uh, where this, this, is, this, is, this, this sort of has a, has a nice answer. There's a particular, uh, very concrete and important geometric invariant which we do know exactly how to perceive directly uh, in the topology of M with the algebra of G. And this is uh, Judith Gromov. Okay, so this is the um, so-called Gromov norm. So let's just say, given a topological space X um, and given a homology class um, I guess I'm going to write it like this given a homology class um, that's represented by uh, a, a singular uh, chain In many possible ways, 
this is just a sum of uh, real value linear combinations of singular uh, continuous maps of well, whatever the dimension of this knowledge class is, the simplex uh, into the space X, uh, required to be a cycle and required to represent the given homology class, a given topological space and homology class represented in lots of possible ways as a singular chain, you can ask to minimize Um, the sort of L1 norm, by which we just mean the ordinary L1 norm. So the point is, singular chain groups are vector spaces uh, over the reals, uh, are vector spaces, but they're not just vector spaces, they're vector spaces with a canonical basis, the basis consisting of all uh, singular continuous maps or simplex into your, into your space. Uh, so when you have a vector space with a canonical basis, we have lots of canonical norms on it, namely the LP norms for any P. Here we're just taking the L1 norm. So given uh, this L1 norm on um, uh, uh, singular chains, you can look for the singular chain which minimizes the L1 norm uh, over all representatives of a homology class. We define uh, the L1 norm of a homology class to be the nth. Uh, I guess I want to say, you know what I mean when I mean if I draw this. I mean the inf of the uh, norm of the chains of all chains representing given homology classes. That's, that's terrible notation, but anyway. And so, um, well, of course, it doesn't have to be a topological space. You could also say, given a group, you could sort of associate to the group the space, uh, you know, BG namely the, uh, or the K pi 1, the, the space which is uh, on top of type of a CW complex, which is uh, a fundamental group is isomorphic to G as an abstract discrete group, and whose high homotopy groups are all, are all trivial. Um, and then you can uh, look at, uh, so the homology of this guy is the homology of the group. And so given a homology class in BG, one uh, has a well-defined norm by this construction, and not so hard to show, it doesn't depend on sort of the choice of a topological space BG representing G. Such a space is unique after homotopy equivalence. And um, this, this norm is sort of manifestly uh, homotopy invariant. So, so uh, it's, it only depends on the homotopy type of X. And so given a space X or a group G, given a homology class in X or a homology class in uh, BG, uh, we get a well-defined norm well, norm or pseudo-norm. Uh, it might possibly be zero on a non-zero class, but in any case, it's manifestly topologically invariant because all that it really sees is what you mean by a map of a continuous simplex, uh, a continuous map of a simplex into your space. Okay, so this is a manifestly topological uh, definition, in fact, a homotopy uh, theoretic definition. And so given a manifold, let's say, Closed for convenience, let's say, oriented dimension M, there's a canonical uh, class, which is the fundamental class. It's in the image of the uh, integral homology classes, but it's sort of just the fundamental class of the manifold. So this is uh, canonical so-called fundamental <coughs> class of the manifold. And so you can define the Gromov norm, norm, let's put it in quotes, of M is just equal to this L1, well, pseudo-norm of the fundamental class. Um, if M is not oriented, one could do one of two things. You could look at homology with twisted coefficients. It's a perfectly valid place in which to uh, look at, at uh, norms, or you could pass to a double cover uh, and compute the norm there and divide by two. So, theorem, Gromov, and in fact, this is uh, sort of a key step in Gromov's proof of Mosto's theorem. Actually, we can use this to give a new and uh, sort of, I guess, infinitely preferable proof of, of most rigidity theorem says that for any hyperbolic of dimension n, I guess 
still need to say something about the dementia, but only that it's at least two. Um, the norm, this fundamental class, is equal to the volume times um, a constant, depending only on the dimension n. Uh, well, that might be uninteresting, except that this constant is non-zero. So, um, and in fact, uh, Cromwell didn't prove this, but, but it is, he conjectured, and it is true, that the constant C sub n is just the reciprocal of the volume of the regular uh, ideal simplex of hyperbolic space in that dimension. So, uh, G C2, n, uh, C2 is uh, 1 on uh, and C3 is um, uh, I forget what it goes after that. I also don't remember what the reciprocals of these are, but anyway. Uh, this is pi, obviously. Uh, this is the volume of a regular ideal. Uh, I want three simplex. Okay, so, so this is great. This is a really um, exactly the kind of, the best possible kind of answer we would like to, to have to this problem. Given a topological space or, or a group, um, we have this completely straightforward definition of an invariant Determining what the value of the invariant is might be very difficult, but making the definition and showing that it's a topological invariant, that's, that's completely straightforward. And then by you know, black magic or, or something, um, it turns out to capture exactly a key piece of the geometry that we were looking for. Here, that the volume can be recovered directly from this manifestly topological invariant. Okay, so there's already, I think that there's something a little bit kind of, a uh, little bit, a little bit, uh, you've got to be a little bit careful. So, so the, 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 the theorem of Musso is, is stated and is, is valid only in dimension at least three. The theorem of Gromov is stated and valid only in dimension at least two. Um, and so in the case of dimension two, of course, it's very interesting. What Gromov's theorem says is that even though, and we know it's, it's a fact that hyperbolic structures on two-dimensional manifolds are certainly not, well, not unique, uh, given a you know, topological closed, uh, topological two-dimensional uh, 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 manifold, uh, depending on the topology of the manifold, we might have no hyperbolic structures at all, or we will typically have sort of infinitely many of them parameterized by five type model spaces, or modulized space if you care about marking. Um, in any case, there's lots of really great deal of flexibility in these geometric structures. Nevertheless, some vestige of, of rigidity remains. Gromov says that, that the volume can be recovered directly from the topology and of course, in the case n equals 2, this is only more or less just the, the gauss bonnet theorem that says that the volume of a hyperbolic uh, surface is uh, proportional to the Euler characteristic. And by the way, um, in even dimensions, this is uh, also, well, okay, the fact that the volume is proportional to Euler characteristic is sort of well-known uh, fact. It's, it's essentially Chern, Chern's generalization of gauss bonnet um, but in all dimensions, order characteristic is zero. That has proportionality between order characteristic and volume. However, the constant of proportionality is zero. So Gromov, very excitingly, gives you a new topological invariant where the constant of proportionality is non-zero. And moreover, it's some very interesting numbers you can calculate and have interesting number theory and so on and so forth. So we have this invariant. We have proportionality between this invariant and some geometric, topological invariant, some geometric invariant we care about. And the constant of proportionality sort of means something. So this is a model for the kind of theorem we'd like to prove. And um, the, the inf is achieved No, actually it's not achieved. It's actually never achieved. Um, the, the, the one. Sorry. So if you look at this fundamental class, the inf fundamental class, the more is achieved. 
No, no, no. So the fundamental class, the fundamental class, um, it's represented by a sequence. It depends how you set things up. If we're restricting ourselves really to deal with topological spaces and genuine, honest to God, uh, singular, singular chains, so maps of closed synthesis into the space, then, then, then in fact the norms, in this context, the norm is never achieved because the volume of a actual closed simplex, well, this is straightening procedure. If you straighten the simplex, the volume of it of a straight simplex is always strictly less than that of the of the ideal simplex. So in fact, yeah, the, the norm is not achieved. In fact, in this case, however, if you kind of want to bend the point a little bit and deal in a slightly more flexible category, um, if you allow yourself more general objects than than singular chains, for instance, if you allow yourself um, well measurable chains and sort of uh, infinite simplices, but with sort of somehow controlled geometry, you can set it up so that these things can be can be uh, uh, achieved. And actually, there's a very nice sort of stronger statement of rigidity in that, in that context, which says that in dimension three and higher, um, not only is the, not only is the, um, not only is there this proportionality, but if you take a sequence of chains converging to the, to the optimum, and then sort of look at kind of representatives by straightening them. In fact, they, they converge to the equidistributed sort of uh, chain. So there's sort of more rigidity there than is even manifest in this theorem that if you, if you kind of bend the, bend the point and, and, and allow yourself to sort of work in suitable completions, the theorem is achieved uniquely. Yeah. Um, there's kind of a version of, there's sort of a context in which there's some kind of rigidity of this kind. I might, I might have time to talk about it in this, in this lectures, but we'll, we might get back to that later. Does the coefficient matter real or original? No, no, no. I mean, you're always taking an infinitum. So, so by the way, um, the condition of, okay, so you have to be a little bit careful. Here, alpha is a real valued chain, alpha homology class. You, you need the cycle, you need, it to be, you need it to be in the image of the, of the rational homology. So, so for instance, if, if, if alpha was a, was a rational class, meaning really just that it has rational periods of the, of the cycles, um, then if you look at real value chains that represent it, the condition of being a cycle and the condition of having particular values on particular, on particular uh, you know, pairing in an appropriate way with, with, with cohomology, that, 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 that condition um, is, those are a finite collection of rational linear conditions. So, so if you have a real value cycle, you can approximate it by a rational value cycle in the same homology class, and, and approximate it arbitrarily well in the L1 sense. So, so in that case, yeah, if alpha is a, is a rational homology class, then you can approximate everything by rational chains, and so you can you can allow yourself rational rational uh, uh, cycles. If you don't, if you allow yourself only inter integral cycles, then, then you can't necessarily do this approximation. I mean, that's a, that's a sort of whole different story. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so... Great, so question. So can one do the same? For other geometric invariants, Well, we don't know what the same means, but let's ask a much more uh, concrete question. Let's say, can the lengths of the closed GD6 and M and hyperbolic be recovered? And let's be even more ambitious not just from some topological invariant, I mean, in some abstract logical sense, they can be the topological invariant being, you know, the manifold. Um, but, but can they be recovered sort of in, in, a, in a kind of, you know, in a, in a sort of precise sense like this from, I'll just say, from homological, and I'll even put in brackets, bounded and so homological uh, invariants. Of M, by which I mean the kinds of L1 L infinity invariants of homology defines you know in an analogous way. Um, so so the question is, so we can recover the fundamental class of the manifold. Can we sort of recover 
I'm sorry, can I cover the volume of the manifold? Can we recover um, sort of more detailed information, lengths of GVC? The reason to, by the way, to sort of, what's it mean to talk about lengths of closed geodesics? In a hyperbolic manifold, every homotopy class, every non-trivial homotopy class of loop has a unique uh, geodesic representative. Every free homotopy class of loop has a unique geodesic representative. So closed geodesics are in bijection with non-trivial conjugacy classes in the fundamental group. So, so at least the objects under consideration here you know, the, the, the data, the input to the problem, the topological input to the problem is well defined. We have a topological manifold and we have a conjugacy class of element in pi 1. Or we have a group guaranteed to be the fundamental group of a hyperbolic manifold and we have a conjugacy class of element in that group. And we want to know, we're told somehow that there is some hyperbolic structure floating around. This homotopy class has some uh, geodesic representative. It has some length. What is the length? Can we recover it? We perceive that geometry directly. In the, in the, so I thought this build up, it's kind of disappointing to say that I actually don't know the answer to this question. Um, but what I want to sort of propose is that I have a conjectural answer to this question, which is a probabilistic answer. Conjectural probabilistic answer. I'll just say. So what I mean by that is that if I take a random geodesic of some length, and then I look at the conjugacy class in the fundamental group, and I look at that just as an element in a group, abstract group, I should be able to recover the length of the geodesic up to any tolerance that we specify in advance. So it's a probabilistic and a uh, uh, approximate answer. So I should be able to recover the length up to a smaller, smaller uh, 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 error as I like. And I should only be able to do this almost all the time. Some elements are just going to be a bit weird, but most elements of, uh, which happen to be represented by loops of length n, I should be able to directly uh, tell you what the length is just by looking at them algebraically. Conjectural, because I don't know how to prove this yet, but, but um, we can prove an analogous statement um, with a theorem for uh, as a, you know, now in the world of group theory, for, for a, a, a simple but, but important class of groups, namely for free groups. So we're going to prove a theorem for free groups. We're going to conjecture a theorem for hyperbolic groups or hyperbolic manifolds. And um, we have certain kind of evidence for this conjecture for hyperbolic manifolds. If you, if you, if you kind of flexible that between by approximate, if you say, well, I don't want to know the exact length, but I want to know the length up to a fixed order of magnitude. So I just want to say up to, up to, a, up to a ratio of 100. Right? Then, then, then it's a theorem. Then we can say, in fact, we can recover the length up to a, up to a bounded multiplicative constant, which sort of probabilistically in, in a hyperbolic group or a hyperbolic manifold. And the nice thing about it is that the answer is going to depend in the end on the bounded homological Sorry, on, on the sort of homological invariance, sort of bound, bounded uh, cohomology, L1 L L L homology, um, and it's going to be a constant of proportionality, and the constant is going to be, is going to depend only on, well, in the case of manifolds, only on the dimension of the manifold. Uh, in, in the case of groups, on, you need to sort of set up on, on, on some, some natural invariant associated to a presentation of a group. Okay. So, to state, the conjectural answer and the, uh, the theorem in the case of free groups, I need to now take a detour uh, and discuss um, <coughs> so the main sort of group theoretic uh, uh, context I'll be talking about for the rest of these, of these lectures, namely on the topic of stable commutator length. Um, let me go back over there. So is there something special I'm supposed to do with this? Just treat like a person. <laughs> okay. All right. Not the So that was zero. This is now one. So the subject. 
in which one talks about things like runoff and variance and so on is often called the subject of bounded cohomology. And I think this reflects the fact that everyone likes, you know, functionals and uh, Banach spaces and all this kind of thing more than they like, you know, maps of triangles into topological spaces. On the homological side, everything is maps of triangles. Um, and it's really on the homological side that I want to really discuss what's going on. So I'm always going to be talking about, I'm always going to be talking about triangles. So I'm going to be Okay, so this is, but this is now just an abstract uh, uh, discussion we can have. Um, it's a topic in, in, in geometric group theory. So, so let's let G be a group, and let's let this denote the commutator subgroup. Okay, so the commutator subgroup is the subgroup of G generated by commutators. Well, but since the inverse of a commutator is a commutator, it's the subgroup generated as a semigroup, if you like, uh, turns out to be a group, by a set of all commutators. Okay, so um, on the other hand, it's, uh, it's not, as some, some undergraduates think, uh, the, the group consisting of commutators, because uh, there are elements in the commutator subgroup which are not themselves commutators, but are products of commutators. So um, if you have an element, commutator subgroup, the commutator length you're going to note this CL is just it's the least number of commutators in G whose product is little g. By the way, a commutator where the commutator of two elements for me will just be this quantity. Some people use uh, G inverse H inverse GH. I guess it has better properties, notational properties in some context. But anyway, this, this is for me what a commutator is. Least number of commutators in G whose product is, is lead G. And the stable commutator length is the limit of the commutator length of G to the end divided by n. So, so the commutator length of G to some power is sub-additive as a function of the power. The commutator length of G cubed is less than or equal to the commutator length of G times the commutator length of G squared because if I have an expression of G is product of commutators and I have an expression of G squared is a product of commutators, can concatenate them like an expression of G cubed as a product of commutators. So it might go down, but it, it, it's, it's sub additive, and therefore this limit exists. And uh, very quickly, I want to sort of ignore the, the group theoretic uh, definition and really think of this as a topological or geometric quantity in the following way. So, Okay, so so we have a space. So for me, a group is always going to be the fundamental group of some space, and. I'm never really going to care about what the space is. Um, in the sense that I really, I care about it only up to homotopy, but even more than that, I only care about it from the point of view of maps of sort of one and two dimensional things into it. So you might say, well, I should care about pi 2, and I actually in the end don't, don't really care about pi 2 because I don't really care about families of maps of surfaces, but I only really care about the existence or non-existence of maps. Of surfaces. So x is going to be a space. All I know about it is that its fundamental group is going to be G, and that's really all I'm going to care about. If you like, if you really want a concrete space, you could let x be a KG1, I mean a BG. Right? You could let all the high homotopy groups be trivial if you want. 
So an element of G, or a conjugacy class, which by the way is a conjugacy class, corresponds to a homotopy class, free homotopy class, of loop in X. So I'm going to translate a group and an element of that group, or a conjugacy class in that group, into a space and a free homotopy class of loop in that space. And I really, I don't, I don't really care much about groups. I'm really going to be talking about, about spaces from now on. So here's my space. Here's my um, very wrongy. I'm going to um, draw gamma ray S1 as a loop in X rather than as a map from a circle to X, but you know what I mean. Okay, so the commutator length turns out to be the least genus of a surface <coughs> mapping to X in such a way that its boundary represents gamma. And the reason for this is that if we look at a surface with one boundary component oriented, compact surface with one boundary component, then, I mean, up to me having labeled things wrong, um, the boundary is the product of commutators in a free generating set for the fundamental group of this surface. So the fundamental group of this compact oriented surface is free. You can see that because it's, sort of, it's a surface with a puncture, so it retracts down to a graph. So its fundamental group is, is free. It's free on these, these generators here, these alpha and beta curves, and this boundary curve is the product of the commutators. So if you have any um, representation of a loop uh, in the fundamental group here, uh, on the fundamental group here is a product of commutators, well, you can just send the generators to say if I have uh, this loop here is, uh, so suppose G can be expressed as a product, A1, B1, A2, B2, I can just send alpha 1 to A1, B1 to B1, uh, alpha 2 to A2, beta 2 to B2, and then there's no obstruction to extending this map over, you know, this sort of, uh, well, there's no two scales, non topically speaking, so I have the map on this surface, I map it across, and it's going to take the boundary uh, to the homotopy class, the free homotopy class of gamma. So if I can express an element as a product of, at most, G commutators, then I can find a surface of genus at most G mapping to my space, such a way that the boundary it represents my loop. Conversely, if I have a map of the surface to the space whose boundary represents my loop, that gives me an expression for the corresponding element of the fundamental group as a product of commutators. Okay, so the moral of the story is that the commutator length of G is the least genus of the surface S running to X in such a way that the boundary uh, represents yeah. okay. the map of the boundary to X represents the free homotopy class of gamma. What about stable commutator length? So let's take this just as a lemma. The proof is not, is not difficult. Um, so I'm going to call a surface, uh, a map of a surface admissible if it has the following kind of structure. So I've got my surface S. This is going to be compact oriented surface, possibly with boundary, almost certainly with boundary. Uh, it's going to map to X by some map F. I've also got a circle mapping to X by gamma. So I want this diagram here to commute. I want this surface to map to X with the boundary factoring through this circle. And um, in this context, um, I define N of S to be the number such that N of S times the fundamental class of S1 is um, the image of the fundamental class of the boundary. Okay, so I have a compact oriented surface. Compact and oriented is a fundamental class. Its boundary is a one manifold. It's a compact oriented one manifold. Its boundary is a fundamental class. This is a union of circles. It might be seven circles, it might be 39 circles, it might be zero circles. Anyway, it has a union of circles. 
And so this is this is oriented circles. This has a fundamental class. This is a map from one manifold to another one manifold. Um, it takes the homology class here, so some homology class here. The homology of a circle of dimension one is z. So whatever it takes it to, it's going to be a multiple of the fundamental class here. Let that multiple be n of s. Okay. So I'm going to define, um, so here's just some notation, chi minus of a connected surface is going to be the minimum of the order characteristic on z. So this is only relevant if the surface is a disk or a sphere. My surface is always going to be oriented. So if it's a disk or a sphere, the order characteristic is 1 or 2, but the order characteristic superscript minus is going to be 0. Otherwise, this is just the ordinary Euler characteristic. And in general, Euler characteristic of a surface is the sum over the components of this Euler characteristic minus. So you look at each component. If it's a sphere or a disk, you ignore it. And all the other components, you add up the Euler characteristic, and that's chi minus. This is just definition here. I haven't stated the lemma yet. The lemma is that the state of commutator length of G is the infimum over all of these maps of admissible surfaces of uh, minus uh, uh, minus of s on um, two n s. And I guess I want to insist on n s even or equal to zero. I can always achieve this by changing the orientation of the surface if necessary. Okay, so what does this say? This says that we're looking at all maps of surfaces to x, possibly with lots of boundary components, and the boundary components wrap around gamma, each, each boundary component wraps around gamma some number of times. So we have a surface, a bunch of boundary components. I didn't say the surface had to be connected. It's very important not to insist that it be connected. We might as well assume it has no disk or sphere components, though. Um, well, almost. We almost might as well assume it has no disk or sphere components. Um, and it's mapping here to gamma. And so each of these guys is going to wrap some number of times around gamma. So this might wrap seven times, this might wrap two times, this might wrap minus four times, this might wrap, you know, a lot of times. Um, and then the total degree, so n in this case, is uh, 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 anyway, some big number. Right. So, anyway, I hope, that, I hope that the, the meaning of this lemma is clear. It just says that the same commutator length can be, can be um, deduced by looking at, so the commutator length is deduced by looking at maps with one boundary component to x, and the boundary component has to wrap once around gamma. Here we're looking at surfaces with possibly lots of boundary components. The components can wrap any given number of times, and you look at the algebraic sum of the number of times that it wraps around gamma, and instead of computing, instead of counting the complexity of the surface by genus, you count the complexity of the surface by minus all that characteristic prime divided by twice the degree. And the reason for this is that, well, all the characters, when you're looking at the stable commutator length, you're sort of saying, instead of looking at the loop, look at the powers of the loop, right? The square of, of the element is like the powers of the loop, the cube is like the third power, and so on. So you're looking at taking finite covers of this loop, and if you take a finite cover of a surface, the genus is not multiplicative on the finite covers, but the order characteristic is, is multiplicative, and minus all the characteristic on two is approximately the genus. So for big genus, this is, morally speaking, the same thing. Anyway, so this is, this is just a letter. If you like, you can take this as a definition. This is a better definition anyway. Let, let this be the definition of stable commutator length. Who, who cares about commutators and groups? That's, that's, this is the best definition. All right, a nice thing about this, and something we'll make use of a little bit later, is that we can define stable commutator length of formal sums of elements. It sort of suggests if the domain is a surface with multiple boundary components, why can't the range also have multiple components? Okay. So this is a perfectly straightforward thing to do. Um, you can take a, uh, a formal sum of elements in a group. This is just a formal sum. 
not just notations or a name, it's a form of some of elements, but we want, it, we want the product, so we want the product of these guys to be homologically uh, trivial. So a form of sum of elements representing zero in, in uh, group homology, if you like. Okay? So this thing here, to this, corresponds a, um, a map of a collection of circles into X. So one circle for each GI. So it corresponds to a formal sum of conjugacy classes. We have a uh, map of a one manifold into X. Okay? Now possibly with multiple boundary components. And then we can just define the stable commutator length of this formal sum in exactly the same way as the inf of all admissible surfaces, where now you have to be a little bit careful. You have a surface mapping to X, and its boundary factors through this map of this one manifold, but now you have to insist, so such that the fundamental class of this guy here is equal to a multiple of the fundamental class of this guy. So this guy, the homology is now bigger than one dimensional in general, so the image of this fundamental class may not be a multiple of the fundamental class here. So we just insist, we only pay attention to clock maps such that the boundary wraps the same number of times algebraically around each circle. Okay, that's all this means. That number of times is this n. And we just define, okay, so define slash lemma. And in that sense, is this a lemma? Well, if you really want to, you can give a completely algebraic definition of commutator length of a formal sum and commutator length of stable commutator uh, of a formal sum, in which case it's a lemma. Let me just give the definition here. What we do in this little box, because that's how, how much I don't really care about it. So, so the commutator length of a formal sum is just, you look at all, um, what do we want this to be? We want this to be commutative in each of the GI and a class function in each GI separately. So that we have to be able to replace each GI by its commutator. Sorry, by, by any conjugate. So whatever it is, is an inf over conjugates of the GI. Okay, so you look at, and well, that's HI, the elements that are going to conjugate the GI, and you just look at the commutator length of the product. This just means take GI and conjugate it by HI. It just means conjugate. Okay, so we just take these elements, multiply them together, except we don't look at the elements, we look at the conjugacy classes, so we look at the product of conjugates of them. And we can do that, we can pick any such way of doing it. Picking different ways might give different elements with different commutator lengths. You look at the one which gives the least it's going to be a minimum because it's integer valued. And then stable commutator length, found exactly the same way as before, just the limit, n goes to infinity of the commutator of uh, the commutator length of we just take n powers in each guy individually and divide by n. Okay. So the nice thing about this is. But this is now an invariant of a formal sum of elements. And so you can extend it to a quote unquote pseudo norm. And, and let, me, let me kind of just take a half of that point here to say what I mean. If you raise each j into a separate power. What's that? Uh, if, uh, if you take the sum of j into the power n, I, yeah. you only assume that the line goes to infinity. Um, I don't know what you get if you do that. Uh, well, the GIs could be raised to different powers. For, first of all, you, you'll probably get something which is not homologically trivial. So, so maybe you condition it on being homologically trivial and then let the powers go up in different ways. I, I actually don't know what you get. I mean, I, you get, I, I do know what you get. You're going to get the, you're going to get, there's a formal vector space generated by the GI. There's a subspace of that consisting of homologically trivial elements. You're going to be looking at the infimum of stable commutator length on that on that norm ball. On, on, on that on that on that yeah guys on that yeah. But so, so yeah, we can we can do that. Okay. 
So I've got words to get. So what I want to say is that we can define um, so B on G, this is just real value uh, homologically trivial formal sums of elements of G. Homologically trivial meaning representing zero in one dimensional homology. Um, the rational guys are dense in this. If you have a rational guy, I mean, define a function on this, which, well, okay, anyway. So, we can define stable commutator length uh, extends by linearity on A's and continuity to a pseudonorm on this vector space. And it vanishes on a subspace which is taking in nth power is the same as multiplying by n because the whole way that the setup is, is, is defined over here is to make it insensitive to covers. It's basically saying if you replace a loop by an n-fold cover, that's the same as multiplying by n. And it doesn't matter which n-fold cover you take. The whole, the whole setup is completely agnostic about which n-fold cover you take. So taking an n-fold cover is the same as multiplying by n. So taking n copies of g or taking g to the n power should be the same. And then, second of all, they said it was a class function, so g should be indistinguishable from its conjugates. So this is just a subspace. You just look at the, the vector subspace spanned by elements of this kind. And so SCL is a pseudonym um, the quotient we call B1H, by which I just mean B1 modulo this subspace. This is just a topological vector space, and it seals a pseudonorm on it. Pseudonorm because it might be zero on some non-zero elements. But if you really care about that, then the uh, following theorem, which is just, I mean, it's just a sort of little observation that's kind of nice in this language, if I, if I took Koji and I sort of observe this, that if G is hyperbolic, then uh, SCL is a, an actual honest to God norm on B1H. Okay. okay, so so you have a normed vector space here. You have a, a vector space with a norm on it. Um, by the way, there's sort of a direct way to see this normed vector space. It's kind of an interesting construction. And uh, this construction was, was actually discovered by uh, my student, Don Ping. Don Ping Juan. So he noticed a nice geometric construction of this normed vector space. So, so what you do, uh, I only mention this. It's quite a nice construction, so let me just say what it is. So you look at a group. G, and you look at S, the set of all commutators. Then you can look at the Cayley graph of the commutator subgroup generated by all commutators. So this is just a Cayley graph with one, it's just a graph with one vertex for every commutator, so one vertex for every element of the commutator subgroup, and two vertices are joined by an edge if one is uh, the product of the other by a commutator. Okay, so this is a graph, and so you can think of it as a metric space in the usual sense by giving every edge uh, length one, and then you just look at this graph from infinitely far away. You rescale it. Well, as you rescale it, notice that left and right multiplication are almost the same here. If you multiply something on the left, or if you multiply things on the right, the difference is a commutator. The commutators all have length one here. So that says that this group, when it acts on itself, it's almost, the left multiplication and the right multiplication are almost the same. And if you rescale the metric infinitely far away, then multiplication becomes exactly commutative, right? Because the difference between left and right gets scaled away to zero. So in the loop, you get a nice abelian group, actually. If you rescale this, so rescale, you get an abelian group. And it was a metric space, so you actually get a normed abelian group. 
and there's a big fat piece of it, which is a long vector space. And that long vector space is basically this top vector space. That's kind of a nice, a nice way to see this directly without kind of waffling on about surfaces and commentaries and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, it's kind of nice. You can do this with other things, other, other kind of laws than just you know, commentators. You get Anyway, so that's, that's commutator and stable commutator and definitions. Finally, I have a chance to state the theorem and the conjectures. And the next two talks, I'll try to give complete self-contained proofs. So in a group, what's the analog of the length of a GD stick? Well, the length of a GD stick requires us to choose a metric. And choosing a metric is a little bit like choosing a generating set for the group. So if we have a group and we have a choice of generating set for the group, then the word length of an element is a little bit like the length of the GD stick representative. So the first theorem. says the following. So let fk be free of rank k, and we assume we've chosen a free generating set, so we can talk about the length of an element with respect to that generating set. And then for epsilon, there exists, so I just have some constants here, such that, okay, so let's let g n be a random element of word length n conditioned to lie in the commutator subgroup. Okay, so you would pick a random element of word length n conditioned to lie in the commutator subgroup. Then you look at the commutator length, this is the stable commutator length of this element. Um, <laughs> all right, all right, let me pass this. Let me pass this. C is bigger than 1, little c is bigger than 0, and the little c is pretty big when it is big. Well, it's not huge, but it's big. Capital C to the minus and the little c is very, very small. It's going to 0 exponentially fast. Big O means up to a constant. Up to a constant is still going to 0 very, very fast. Okay? This is PR for probability. The probability of something is 1 minus something that goes to zero exponentially fast. Okay, so with extremely high probability, something is true. What's true? <laughs> so the same problem, so what is n? n is the length of this word, right? So the length of the GD so could be like. What's the state of commutator length? It's like it's like a kind of Gromov norm. It's like a homological kind of norm. It's telling you something about the relationship between the stable commutator length and the length. If you like, I can put this up here. I have to multiply epsilon by n over log n. But anyway, so it says the stable commutator length is very, very close to n over log n times log 2k minus 1 over 6. So what's nice about this is that, first of all, it says that almost all the elements of length n have almost exactly the same stable commutator length. That's kind of surprising to me. Second of all, it says the order of magnitude is n over log n. So that's the growth rate is, is some very specific thing. And thirdly, the constant of proportionality, it depends here on the rank in a very concrete way. So 6 is sort of, well, that's 6 is just 6. Um, log 2k minus 1 is what? So if you have a free group of rank k, and you have a word of length m, it's a reduced word, so every letter cannot be equal to the inverse of the, of the following letter. So what that means is if you build this word letter by letter randomly, at every stage you have 2k minus 1 choices. So log 2k minus 1 is just the, the entropy 
of the random process. If I see someone spitting out a reduced word in the free group randomly by adding letter by letter, it's like random process. It has some entropy. The entropy is log 2k minus 1. Okay. So that's a theorem. So here's conjecture 1. Sorry? Well, I'm not surprising. I mean, it should be six because everything is very secretly about surfaces. So surfaces are fat and trivalent graphs. Trivalent graphs have three. Anyway, that's. I don't know. I mean, look, this is what it is. I mean, I can't, you know. Look, the constants are all a bit silly. Cycle commutator has a silly factor of two in it anyway. That's, that's, that should really be just Euler characteristic. Or mine's all okay. Okay, so conjecture one. So let's let M be a hyperbolic manifold, closed hyperbolic manifold of dimension D. Um, just pick some delta bigger than zero and blah, blah, just blah, 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 uh, such a Let gamma be a random geodesic with length. I can't make my lengths be discrete. I can't make them be equal to exactly integers because they just the lengths are just what they are. So I'm going to make my length be approximately equal to m. Pretty close. m minus delta m plus delta. I've ch chose delta in advance. I can even make delta go to zero pretty quickly with m if I want. But I don't really care. But yeah, it's just a random geodesic. Let's say. It's closed geodesic. Closed geodesic. Conditioned to be homologically trivial. If you find that in the just work in a manifold where H1 is trivial, and that's, that's, that's fine. Conditioned to be homologically trivial, then, well, exactly the same thing. So, so gamma, um, I'm going to say stable commutator length of gamma, meaning stable commutator length of the conjugacy class in the fundamental group corresponding. 2k minus 1, I have d minus 1, which is the entropy of the, of the volume entropy of hyperbolic d space. Right? And conjecture 2, uh, that g be a hyperbolic group, s a generating set, that lambda be such that the number of elements of length n is approximately lambda to the n. So it turns out that there is, in fact, a constant lambda such that there are lambda to the n elements of lambda. The of Kermier. Um, so that's GN random and N conditions being the commutator subgroup, then the probability So this, this is really what I'd like to prove. It says if I have a hyperbolic group and a generating set of a random word of length n, condition to be the commutator subgroup, the stable commutator length should be almost exactly n over log n times log lambda over 6, where log lambda, or lambda is the entropy, log lambda is the entropy of you know, the, the process which generates a random word in your group. Okay, so theorem is true for the free group. I should have said um, n has to be even because otherwise there are no homologically trivial words of length n. But anyway, so this is always the length you have to adjust so that, that you know, there are possibly elements, homologically trivial elements of it. Lambda is the growth rate of the group. Yes, yes, s is a generating set. Given a generating set, given a generating set, let the growth rate of the group with respect to that generating set be lambda. No, but he, so this, you did on an exactly crucial point. This theorem is supposed to be true in dimension two. What is this theorem trying to say? It's trying to say, I can recover the length of a geodesic from a purely topological algebraic invariant. 
Well, that's nonsense. In dimension two, the, the, the length of the GVC is not determined by the group. There are different hyperbolic metrics on the surface. So what is it actually saying? It's saying I had to choose the metric in order to understand what I meant by a random geodesic of some length. So I, the way in which I decided what I mean by random is secretly saying something about the metric. It's not saying everything about the metric, it's saying something about the metric. So think of the following analogy. Supposing you live in some hyperbolic manifold, and you move house, and you get all your geodesics, and you pack them in boxes. So you take all the GD6 of length 3, you put them in some box, all the GD6 of length 7, you put them in some box, and then you move house and you come to a new place, you come to unpack the GD6, but you realize you forgot to label the boxes. The point is you can, you can recover the labels just from the, the algebraic invariant. You know which box has the guys of length 7, which guys has the length of length 13. You have to put them in boxes first, which is really what you mean by so this, this, you have to say what you mean by this probability, sequence of probability measure. See, the nice thing about the fundamental class is there's only one of them. So you don't need to worry about probability somehow to choose it. You choose the same one every time. But a random judicious, you have to say what you mean by random. And there's no way around that. So there's different ways of deciding what you mean by random. This is somehow the metrics a natural way to do it. But it's telling you something quite, you know, telling you something strong in, in addition to this. Anyway, so to my no, uh, Wednesday I'm going, to, I'm going to try to give a complete proof of this and actually, what I think is very nice, what I think is very nice here in the proof is that we end up actually constructing what is more or less the extremal surface. We actually end up constructing not just, we don't end up computing not just the stable plane table, but actually constructing what is more or less the, 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 the best surface that it bounds. And that surface itself has some very nice sort of um, features. It's, it's basically a random graph of a certain kind, a random trivalent graph of a certain kind. And, and so um, I think it would be very interesting to sort of study the properties of, the, of these sort of quote unquote extremal surfaces. One. And then I can talk about, so these theorems, these conjectures here are theorems, if instead of asking these things to be equal up to epsilon, you just say they're equal up to, a, up to some constant, up to some multiplicative constant. So you still have this thing, the feature that the commutator length, standard commutator length is grows like n over log n, but the upper and lower bounds, the upper and lower bounds for the constants, but, but we don't know that they're the same. Okay. So, yeah, that's it for today, I think. Well, I've gone way over time.